Well, hello there, and welcome back to another Camera Pro on the Couch, proudly supported by Canon. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. A few um, housekeeping rules. If you do have any questions for tonight's guests, please feel free to put them in the comments section. Um, we'll try and get to it throughout the evening. Um, but yeah, hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, conversation, and I think you'll learn a lot from Brooke. So tonight's guest is Brooke Pike. Now, Brooke is an ocean photographer. Um, she has recently won the 2022 50 Female Fathom Award, and that was actually a award from the Ocean Photography Award. So quite a big achievement and absolutely awesome to bring her on. Thanks for joining us, Brooke. Thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome. Well, as, as, I, as I said, you are an award winner, so it is very a big accomplishment um, to achieve, and, and we think that's a very high regard. But um, do you want to tell us a bit about your journey in photography and how you got started, Brooke? Um, well, my journey started quite a long time ago. I did do a bit of photography when I was in high school, um, mm. and I actually applied to study it at university but didn't get in. Yeah, um, wow. <laughs> so yeah, years later, here I am working as a professional. So it just goes to show that yeah, if you love something, you'll you'll get yourself there eventually. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, that is a great story, and I'm sure we'll we'll cover a bit about that. But how did photography come about? So you're obviously initially um, quite interested and keen in photography, um, and then graphic design become a path. Do you want to explain a bit how that came about? Yeah, so after not getting into photography at university, I then fell mm -hmm. into studying graphic design, um, yep. which I loved. Like, I'm a really creative person, but it just mm. didn't feel quite right the fit for me. Um, yep. And then it was sort of after I graduated from university, I then went to uh, Thailand on a holiday and decided to mm. try skydiving. And then yep. yeah, that's sort of when ocean sort of started to come into my life a bit more and then eventually I started diving lots and I bought a little compact underwater camera. Yes. And yeah, that's kind of just where it kick started for me and I brought photography back into my passion and my eventually my career. So yeah, cool. I started as a dive instructor and then did that for a few years um, overseas and then yep. eventually just started to really fall in love with underwater photography mm -hmm. and I decided at one point I wanted to switch over instead of teaching diving but um, get back into the photo side of things. Oh, great. I've read somewhere initially um, the water was some, somewhat of a, a bit of a question mark for you. It's something that was a little bit scary at first. How did you overcome a little bit of the fear behind water and, and what, what sort of drew the love in for you? Um, I think it was when I was like early teenager and my dad started teaching me how to snorkel and mm -hmm. it was kind of that having the ability to see below the surface and realizing that it looks pretty ferocious from above, but once you see what's under there, it's actually super calming and um, mm. very peaceful. Um, and it wasn't actually something to be feared, like, of course, something to be respected. But um, yep. yeah, I just was like, wow, this is incredible. I need to see more of this. Yeah, cool. And I, I have obviously read too, um, you said probably the best way to to overcome that fear is by actually plunging deep into the water. Um, in, in Thailand, was that quite a, a, a good start, a way to dip your, dip your feet in per se? Yeah, definitely. It was a really safe sort of easy mm. diving environment, you know, no strong currents, no big waves or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely like the best way to sort of ease into it. And I think mm. it was after the second dive that I was like pretty hooked and eventually decided I was coming back to train up to be a dive instructor. Yeah, cool. So Thailand trip happens, obviously um, a nice little holiday for you. You come back to Australia. Where do you go from there? Um, yeah, well, <laughs> so I pretty much just told my parents like, hey, um, I'm just packing up. I'm going to go in a few months back to Thailand. I'm going to do yep. my dive instructor training. And yeah, I pretty much sold everything, put my graphic design career behind me mm. and I went I think everyone was a bit shocked and yep. I kind of just thought you know oh, I'll do it for a bit see if I like it but yeah mm. years later I'm still in that field so yeah yeah and how did you how did you, how did your parents take it at the time Brooke were they pretty receptive to to what you wanted to do uh I wouldn't say so no uh they were pretty yep. shocked I yep. think 
especially my dad, he was kind of like, no, you've got to like follow your career and get this job in like design studio, you know, like mm. you follow that. And then this yep. sort of thing, like, a real just random, spontaneous thing, which, yeah. you know, in the world country was pretty unexpected for them. Yeah, for sure. Um, so go back to Thailand, you then studied to be a diving instructor. Obviously, the, the photography aspect hadn't been fully evolved then. Um, where does photography come into play? Or when did you start realizing, hey, maybe I can dabble one of my interests or my loves with another love? Yeah, so after being in Thailand for a while, I then moved to Indonesia. So I was living mm -hmm. on the island of Bali for a while. And yep. um, the dive school I was working for, they had like a little camera that they used for customers and they gave it to me one day like, hey, do you want to get some photos like of the customers? Like, and then we can use it for Instagram, things mm -hmm. like that. And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, cool. Grabbed the camera. I already, already knew how to use a camera. Um, but yeah, and I was just like, wow, this is actually so fun. And I got pretty obsessed with it and ended up then buying my own camera. Back then it was a Canon G12 with like the yes. Canon underwater housing. Yep. And I... Like from that point on, I couldn't dive without it because <laughs> yeah, I just like, oh, that's just such a good photo opportunity and I didn't have my camera, you know, just, yeah, I became awesome. pretty upset. Pretty hooked. And, and when you were doing a bit of the photography, was it starting, obviously you were taking photos of guests, but then it became something you were doing outside of work as well? Is that sort of how it developed a bit more? Yeah, definitely. So I then started planning like little dive trips focused on photography. So yep. um, a few of my friends were really into it as well. So if we got some time off teaching diving, mm. we would take a trip to like certain places that were really good for macro photography. That's what I really loved in the beginning. Mm. Um, mm. And then we would spend a few days doing like four dives a day just practicing taking photos. So yeah, that's, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and, and I guess... Um, some thoughts that I've had is, um, is it important do you find to, and, and talking to some of the guests that I've had on already, is it important to leave maybe the city you grew up in to go somewhere else because there's that little bit of excitement that, that leaves you wanting to push it a little bit further? Yeah, yeah, it definitely pushes you out of your comfort zone. And I mm. think once you're out of your comfort zone, you're way more willing to sort of explore new things and, yeah, yep. that sense of adventure when you're travelling as well is pretty dominant yeah cool and obviously recommending someone that's starting out wants to do a little bit of more diving or just snorkeling in general obviously places you can recommend it in thailand and um, bali yeah and the whole of indonesia in general is an amazing place to go yep. um it's accessible there's some islands just near the coast of bali that are really great as well like for people that maybe just have a short time it's easy to get to um, yep. Thailand's really great as well. There's loads of different places there and things to see. Um, mm -hmm. And Australia as well. We've got so many opportunities here. So many yeah. people probably don't even have to go far from home. Very blessed. Perfect. So um, growing up, um, was there many beaches nearby you or is it something that kind of came about um, by a bit more chance? Um, not really by chance. Like we would mm. spend all of our summer holidays um, down at the beach. Like I used to do sailing when I was a kid as well. Cool. Um, and then loved swimming. But, yeah, yeah. I just really wasn't like a water baby just then. Yeah, um, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, now, coming back to Australia, um, obviously we've talked a little bit about it. It was around, was it about 2018, 2019, would you say, Brooke? Um, it was in 2021 that I moved back to Australia. 2021. Yeah, I had been a few yep. times in between, but yeah, that's when I kind of made the, the big move back. Yeah. And when you were coming back, were you going to back to home or were you um, exploring different places within Australia at that point? Um, with all the lockdowns and everything, my aim was to get to the Ningaloo Reef to apply for photography jobs, but I yep. did get um, in Victoria for a while and eventually mm -hmm. managed to get out in between lockdowns and go up to Queensland um, for a few months and then yeah, I nice. finally offered a job on the Ningaloo Reef which is where I am now and that yeah, was kind cool. of my plan all along. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Talk to us a bit about Ningaloo Reef and why that's so special to you. What made you first originally want to apply um, and then from the from that process what we, was it an instant love? What sort of developed with Ningaloo? So when I first realised which is probably in about 2020 
that I really wanted to be a photographer and sort of yep. take that step into that field and get out of dive instructing. Mm-hmm. I just started following a lot of photographers based on the Ningley Reef um, yep. that worked here as photographers. And I knew that it was like an opportunity here to do that full time where yes. not many places in the world you can really do that. Certainly. And I just sort of saw it at this as this location where you just have all this amazing wildlife and mm. great conditions photograph in that's really accessible yep. and it's a great place to sort of build up your skill and get a good reputation so um yeah I just sent out my resume to pretty much every company just hoping to get a job and eventually I did and yep. um I never worked professionally as a photographer so I yeah, just had a yeah yeah basic I'd... portfolio um of work and then <laughs> at that point I was like oh okay I really need to get a better camera <laughs> um, <laughs> That was a bit of an investment, but yeah, it's yeah. definitely, yeah. Yeah, and yeah for sure. I, I, I think it's incredibly interesting, obviously, that your first professional gig was a true professional gig where you were just doing nothing but taking photos. Were you ever, yeah. um, were you ever getting paid for any of your work previous to your um, decision to move? Um, a little bit. So one mm. of the companies I worked for, um, they had me running their social media. This was in yep. an, on a small island called Nusa Lembong and just near Bali. And yep. um, yeah, Beautiful so they would spot. actually pay me for a couple of days just to go out and get some content and things for them to help promote their, their work. Um, sure. And their dive center. So yeah, a, a little bit, but not on the level that I'm doing it now. Mm, mm. And I guess what factored in the decision to move back home? Um, I know we've talked a little bit about it, obviously lockdowns and and such, but was there a desire to come back to Australia um, that sort of drew you back? Yeah, definitely. Like living in a third world country for such a long time, like it does take its toll. And Mm. I just wanted to be able to afford to buy like a professional camera set up eventually, which would mean going back and getting a real job (laughs) as my dad (laughs) Yeah. Um, so sort of coming back to reality and um, working hard and not that I didn't used to work hard but you know island lifestyle is pretty relaxing for sure um, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> sort of, you know as someone that's been to um, Bali and Thailand I can speak pretty highly <laughs> of both of those places awesome yeah, so you, not, yeah it's not so where you can live I guess forever and sort of hope to um, progress in like a career path like I am now yeah I certainly understand that. Um, so, obviously, coming back, had you bought had you bought your first professional camera system before you'd um, applied, or is that something that you bought maybe with a, a couple of paychecks in? How did that sort of work? Um, so, yeah, I didn't have a good camera when I applied. I just I mm. wasn't really sure to get something, so I didn't want yep. to spend like, all my money and then yeah have this amazing camera and no job to use it for. Um, for sure. So I. I took out a loan actually and then um, I managed to pay it off that sort of that first year and right. yeah my, one of my first days on the job was the first, one of the best times using my camera so it's kind of one of those like a team make it situations but I actually got some of my favorite shots on my very first day at work wow wow yeah which I was pretty stoked about absolutely that was- you was certainly thrown in the deep end as well, which is which is pretty funny. So obviously you get there, um, you've got you've got your new setup, you got you go there. Obviously you were a bit, you've had you've had really good experience with diving and um, pre diving and, and snorkeling by the sounds of it. Did that background obviously play a, a big part initially? Oh, absolutely. Um, mm. Like so many people that want to live here and work here on the Ningaloo Reef and a yep. lot of people that do are incredibly overqualified for the work they do. Mm. Um, having a background as a dive instructor and having years of experience in the water, I think that just made me really employable for this for this job. Like even if yep. I didn't have that extensive photography experience, I had pretty decent shots from my old camera, um, mm. but nothing standard that I've got now. So it was just Absolutely. that little bit that I needed to get in the job and um, in the right place that I needed to be. Yeah, for sure. Um, what were some things that stood out to you right away? Obviously, you've um, you've gone to, to WA, you've gotten the waters there. How do they compare to Indonesia and Bali uh, and the previous experiences you've had? So different. Um, mm. The jungle is really well known for its big animals. So we get yep. whale sharks throughout the year. We get humpback whales and man mm-hmm. trays and all your usual reef critters as well. Whereas a lot of my diving in Indonesia was really 
focusing on like a lot of macro stuff, like the small stuff, and then occasionally mantras and like ocean sunfish and animals like that. But here, what's just really special is you get those huge pelagic animals, which, you know, there's very few places in the world where you can go and almost be guaranteed to swim with a whale shark. And then Pretty I get epic. to the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have, I have read somewhere too, um, you like manta rays as well. I know um, in Bali, I actually went to, to Manta Bay and missed out on that experience. But um, mm -hmm. I guess probably my question here is, you seem to have obviously really enjoyed moving and living in different places. Mum and dad obviously miss you quite a lot. They do, yes. Um, but lucky for them, they got to come and visit me last year and I even got them in, a wa in the water with a whale shark. So I oh, think now that I live a little bit closer to home, at least in the same country, um, it's you know not too hard to go back and visit or have them come here. Yeah, for sure. And dad's probably a bit more happy about um, your career path now. I think so. I think he's proud. <laughs> he's a bit more on board. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Now, now, just covering your current setup, um, Brooke, and how you sort of investigated which was the right move to go for for the current kit that you have. How did you yeah. find, because obviously the landscape for diving photography, ocean photography, is a little bit more intricate um, and a bit more different. Um, and obviously there's probably not the greatest resources out there. How did you discover learning which, which things um, in your kit you needed to buy and, and how, how do you recommend um, other photographers explore that path? Um, yeah, it really depends like what you want to photograph and mm -hmm. like if you're going to do surf photography or like yep. scuba diving or like free diving. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, like, the housing setup that I have is designed for scuba so it can actually go down to 100 metres, not that I would ever dive that deep. Yes. Um, but you can get some setups that will like maybe be waterproof to like 10 metres, which is perfect mm -hmm. for um, and then surf housings are like obviously a bit more robust to deal with um, like swimming through waves and stuff like that. So it just really depends on like where you're wanting to go. If you're wanting to mm. be like a professional or it's just like a hobby, um, mm -hmm. anything with underwater photography, it's very expensive. So yeah, yeah budget really comes into that as well. And I did a lot of research and I think mm. I changed like 10 times about which camera I was going to get. Um and I just spoke to a lot of other photographers that I knew and read some blogs online and I knew that I really wanted a Canon and yeah, yep. Canon had just released the Canon R6 um, mm. not that before I bought it. And yep. so I was kind of looking at that and it was kind of in, in my budget range, but um, it seemed like the good one to start out with. So yeah, yeah that's what I ended up going with. <laughs> good one. Um, what sort of made that push for Canon over other brands? Was there something in particular that you really liked about Canon? I've kind of always used them um, mm. and I just, I don't know, I think once you know something and you're comfortable with it, that's, I'd kind of just wanted to stick with that. And I was mm. always really pleased with how Canon photos looked yep. um, versus other, other brands. I don't know, something just about the colours and the textures and the way the images come out. Um, I really, really liked that and just the usability of it. Like I found the focusing and everything super easy. Um, which with underwater photography, that's pretty important because a lot of the time you're swimming pretty fast, you've got a water, mm. water particles drifting past, you've got fast moving animals. Yeah, that's one of the most important things. Awesome. Um, also, obviously, then you've made the move to WA. You've started at um, Ningaloo and you're really enjoying it. Um, is every day the same or is every day quite different in terms of the photography? Oh, it changes. Like overnight, it changes so mm. much. Mm. Um, one of the biggest factors we have here is weather, weather conditions and water visibility. So yep. the visibility of the water for photographers, it's so important because um, it, if the water is really green and there's loads of particles, you just can't see the animal you're trying to photograph. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so when you get big swell and big winds, it does stir up all that sort of stuff. So yep. it will, yeah, really, really reduce the quality of work that you can put out. Mm. Um but, yeah, like it can be literally like really green and particly one day and then the next yep. day you go out and it will just be like neon blue water, like 50 yeah, wow. meters. You just wow. can't predict it. So awesome. there's no um, off the side of the same. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, I guess oh, that keeps things in interesting, which is really nice. Um, 
what would their typical day in the life of, of Brooke look like? So um, would it be a, a very particular um, set of routines and structure or is it quite loose um, in terms of the photography? Uh, so when I'm working on tour, it is very much the same each day, but with mm -hmm. different wildlife and different weather. So I normally yep. start at around like 6.30 and get my camera ready, close it all up, seal it, uh, make sure everything's clean and ready to go. Yep. And then I will go to the office and pick up the bus and pick up our guests and then head yep. out to the boat. And yep. then once we're out there, we will do a reef snorkel. And that means I've got to capture every moment from the day. So I'm photographing like the coral, mm. the fish, all that sort of stuff. And then we will go out to the back, back of the reef and look for the big whale sharks to swim with. So my job is um, to capture like as many photos of the whale shark as I can, but also mm. people swimming alongside, which can be the most challenging part. Yes. Um, it is quite physical as well. I think one mm. day um, we worked out how far I swam and it's, some days it's between four and five kilometres. Wow. So, yeah. Jeez. It's pretty tiring, but yeah, it's really rewarding. <laughs> big effort, yeah. big effort. And and how do you go? Obviously, at the end of the day, you've you've been doing an exhausting day swimming. You've taken some great photos. Do you find um, there's still time for you to then go home and edit those photos, or how does the editing process work for you? Yeah, so I try and get my editing done every day because otherwise I end up with a backlog. <laughs> yeah. And yep. I've got to go and do this every day. So I normally get home maybe about 3.30 or 4 o'clock and then mm. I will unpack my camera, load everything up on Lightroom and sort through all my photos. So yes. depending on the day, I might have between like four to 600 photos that I need to sort through. Yep. And then I'll just pick out the best ones and then mm -hmm. edit those in Lightroom. Yep. And then, yeah, normally, like on a good day, I'd be done, say, 5, 5.30. But if we've had a longer day, it might be like 7.30 or something like that. So it is yeah. a long day. Yeah. Big effort. But I, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, now, I guess one of the questions I had um, was, was, was about f taking photos that didn't take away from the experience. Because sometimes with a camera in your hands, that can be the option apparatus you see through and every experience goes through your camera. Do you find there's a way um, to overcome, I guess, the experience still being a big part of what you do? Oh, absolutely. Like a lot of the work that I do, particularly with those big animals, it's mm. really exhilarating yep. and that can actually make getting photos difficult because you're so excited or like full of adrenaline that you can't hold your camera steady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I do have so much time in the water that I do get to appreciate those moments as they are, as well as Good capturing one. them. Um, but Good yeah, one. whenever anything epic starts happening, I'm instantly trying to capture it because that's what I love doing. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, another question I had was um, photography etiquette underwater, obviously above land. Um, sometimes people aren't as mindful, especially in a group situation when they're taking photos of other people, experience as well not not only not taking a photo but also taking their own photo how yeah. challenging is that underwater is that something that you experience or have to deal with at all um on the ningaloo not so much because normally i'm the only photographer like mm. um out on the boat, but yep. in previous experiences out on the water yeah if you're working with other photographers there is kind of like a an unspoken rule that if someone's photographing something first, then you just mm. have to wait. Um, you can't just swim in front of them and obviously push them out the way or ruin their for shot. For sure, for sure. Yeah, so there is that level of patience when you're working with other photographers as well, just having to wait your turn. Yeah, yeah. cool, awesome. Um, now, I guess another thought that I've had as well is, is does drone photography, um, get incorporated in the work that you do or is that something you've kind of dabbled in a little bit and what are your thoughts when it um, comes to drone photography do you think it's a bit of a hindrance for the ocean life or you've haven't experienced that as such um from what i've noticed like as long as you keep your distance the mm. animals don't really realize that there's a drone there i mean if you think about all the noisy boats driving around um mm. that way more disturbing for them um, for I've sure. got a small drone which I love using I always get really nervous because I'm obviously taking it off from the boat so you're trying to yep. catch it and get it in position 
Um, but yeah, I love getting drone shots of like um, the humpback whales, especially. That's really cool because you can actually see what they're up to. Whereas from the surface looking across, you just see the the fins coming out. Yeah, whereas wow. You can actually see the behavior and how they're interacting with each other, which is really cool. Awesome. Um, I talked to you a little bit earlier uh, last week when we were talking about your favorite things to um, photograph. We obviously you started doing a lot of macro work initially, but you told yep. me you've since moved on and your favorite thing to photograph is basically big animals or big things. Um, do you want to yep. tell us a bit about um, the change from macro photography to encapsulating things like whale sharks and, and manta rays and things of that description? Yeah, yeah. So I really did start with the teeny tiny critters, which mm. involved seeing a macro wet lens that would screw onto my um, old compact camera. Yep. Um, and that would be photographing things like, you know, sometimes a few millimetres in size, um, which mm. I loved because you could actually just spend a lot of time there with a small animal like a sea slug or a seahorse, something that doesn't move too much and you can just really get creative with it and like Certainly. use different and things like that because that animal's not really moving hmm. whereas with the big stuff it's all a little bit about luck um as like being in the right place at the right time hmm. and then it happen really quickly and you've just got to spontaneously like oh like how am I going to capture this moment and then like five seconds later that moment's gone um so yeah that yeah. creativity with the macro photography is is really interesting but yeah, now definitely. that I do that I find the bigger animals just so thrilling um, yeah, to work. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give you that bit of a dopamine hit for sure. Mm, um, yeah. Sea slugs. That was something that was initially mentioned in um, an interview that I read um, of yours. What? Why yeah. sea slugs especially? They're just so unique. There's thousands of different species and they're often quite colourful with patterns and like mm. all sorts things going on so yep. they kind of are like a bit like an easter egg hunt like when you go on a dive and you're looking for a nudibranch like if you find one you've never seen before and they, they're really list. well yeah so <laughs> it's kind of that, that thrill of like finding a cool critter that you've not seen um but also yeah they're just super fun to photograph because they're just really colorful yeah yeah absolutely um now moving on to the the bigger animals of uh the sea what is some of your highlights at the moment that you've been able to capture? Oh, so many. Um, mm. Yeah, I think one of my highlights last year was swimming with um, whale sharks that were feeding in a krill ball. So yep. krill being like really small shrimp and like billions of them in a dense ball, so dense that you couldn't <laughs> actually see through it. Um, Epic. While that made that really challenging to get photos, it was just a really amazing experience to have these whale sharks basically lunge feeding and mm, charging mm. through the coral, trying to scoop up as much as they could. Um, and then as well, there was actually manta rays and mobula rays feeding too. So it was just like wow. the most crazy, hectic experience. Um, and, yeah, I think there's a photo that you're going to show later of a yep. whale shark um, thrashing its tail as it swims through a ball of krill. Um, that was oh. one of the few photos I managed to get. Sharp. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, we um, will we'll certainly have a look at some of those photos quite soon. We're, we're very keen. Um, now, Brooke, as well, um, I was going to say um, the experiences you've had throughout the water and then obviously you, you're doing it in a, a bit more of a business sense. Um, it's, it's not quite a nine to five. I won't describe it as that because it sounds super interesting anyway. But how do you juggle your personal work when it comes to having a professional job? within the pho photography industry? Yeah, so I generally work five days on tour, um, working for a whale shark company. Mm -hmm. And then on my two days off, I focus more on my own work. So um, like setting up my website and print store and I'm gonna be doing markets as well this year. Um, yep. But also just like taking on other projects, like working for some brands as well. Um, Cause I do do photography above the water. Um, mm -hmm. Cause it helps mm -hmm. me feel well, it's just something a little bit different. For sure. um, so, yeah, there's all these little sort of side hustles that I'm kind of working on at the moment um, just to, like, broaden my field and my experience and I guess, like, maybe open up more opportunities for me in the future as well. 
Yeah, good on you. Good on you. That sounds really good. Um, yeah. how, how, I guess, do you keep things interesting under the water? Like, is there something that you like to dabble in different uh, experimental techniques? Is there something that you have been experiencing lately that you enjoy? Is it um, slow shutter speeds or any uh, different types of flash? What, what keeps you, I guess, invigorated when it comes to underwater photography? Um, yeah, just trying different techniques and I guess mm. um, having different environments to photograph in as well is really interesting. Um, yep. I'm very used to open ocean where you've just got blue water behind an animal, um, which yep. once you've captured a few angles, there's not like a lot you can really sort of get creative with. Mm -hmm. So I have recently started playing around with the slow shutter as well, which I really love the effect of that on moving uh, marine life. Cool. Um, and also incorporating that um, with using strobes as well to get that sort of um, one part of the image is really sharp. And then there's that mm. motion, which looks really, really, really interesting as well. Awesome. Um, now, touching on a bit more of your equipment at the moment, what sort of lenses do you use to capture your shots, Brooke? Yep. So um, for my wide angle photography, I'm using a Canon EF. Uh, 8 to 15 millimeter fisheye lens so that's mm -hmm. for, all the, for all the big animals which um, I love it's like my favorite lens and it's great because you can get really close but still fit those huge animals into the frame and it actually really helps with water um, clarity so even on days wow. where the water may be like quite milky or like a lot of particles mm. the photos still look quite clear because it looks like you're further back than you are um, uh. I've even had will say like oh wow it looks really clear on that day and I was like oh it was actually pretty pretty bad out there <laughs> nice yeah. good tip that's a great and tip. then uh for macro I've only recently got it the RF 2.8 uh 100 millimeter macro mm. lens yeah I've only just started getting to use that so I'm really loving the results so far though yeah that'll be a bit of fun for sure yeah. um I do have a good question from PBJ um D if you want to bring that one up um, and it was something I was going to discuss with you as well. How do you how do you deal with incidents underwater, camera malfunctions, dive gear issues, or staying safe from dangerous wildlife? It's it's a big, quite a broad question. But it, um, can you maybe give it an answer for us, Brooke? Um, yeah, luckily I've had very few camera mm. malfunctions. Um, the only <laughs> the sort of you know, user error ones, like forgot to put in the SD card or or um, battery. <laughs> yeah. Um, Normally that just involves quickly swimming back to the boat and um, and fixing those problems. Um, yep. The main sort of risk with underwater photography is, of course, camera flooding, which um, mm. with thing with a feature that's really good, highly recommend if you ever get one, make sure it's got a vacuum uh, seal so you can actually seal it with a vacuum and that checks if there's any leaks. There's an, even a little light on it that flashes at you if it's like losing pressure. So that's wow. just a little piece of mind. Luckily... Yeah. Would haven't had any issues. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. um, as for wildlife, I've only ever had a few instances where I felt a little bit unsafe, but I'm quite mm. a busy person in the water. Like nothing scares me much. Like I've been surrounded by sharks before and yeah, like while it's really thrilling, I'm not really that that afraid. So I think yeah, it's just okay. a matter of like understanding the animals, um, their body language as well, mm. their behavior just respecting their space. So if you feel that an animal is maybe not happy about you being there, then just get out of yeah. the water. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's really good advice. Thank you very much for your question, PBJ. That was a great question. Um, now let's talk about your award because that is very special and something that I'm sure is very special to you as well. Um, the yeah. Female 50 Fathom Award. Um, and that was part of the Ocean Photography Awards in 2022. Do you want to tell us a little bit that? Because I've done a little bit of reading and it, apparently you can only be nominated for the award. You can't do it yourself as a self-submission. Um, yeah. Is that true? Um, and also, touching on the question as well, um, they introduced the award to encourage women to share their, their, their vision. So if you want to give us a brief description on what that means to you and why this award was special as well. Yeah, so this award is really about celebrating women in photography mm. and like also in ocean conservation because I believe yep. a lot of us who do this work in this field are in at some level some kind of conservationist. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, so basically you have to be nominated by someone to then enter and then you receive an email saying that someone's nominated you um, and then you've got to upload 10 of your best shots as a portfolio. So um, nice. it turns out my partner and one of my friends had nominated me. Um, my partner did actually ask if he wanted, if I wanted him to nominate me and I said no, but he did it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I just, yeah, I just didn't think I had anything sort of worth putting in there after I'd seen like the work of previous people that have won yep. it. So I was yep. honestly really surprised that I did win it because I was just like, oh, fine, like I'll upload these photos. And mm. but yeah, it's it's a really really great award because there is a real like shortage of women in this field. Like mm. there's few female photographers out there that are quite well known so yep. i hope that this can just sort of encourage more people to sort of get into that field um yeah that would be great if yeah more that, yeah awesome and that was sponsored by block pan as well which do make a great series of watches do you want to just quickly show the audience at home what one of the awards was yeah so i actually i uh, was really lucky and got to receive one of these watches from Blanc Pan. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's a dive watch, so it's pretty pretty useful for me. <laughs> yeah, very special, very special. Um, obviously, winning that award um, would have been a testament for all your hard work. Is that something that really confirmed to you how far you've come from the initial days of that first trip to Thailand where you were having a bit of a dive and now where you are now? Yeah, and... You know, I was I was pretty shocked by it as well. I don't think I really understood what it meant when I first mm. read the email that I'd won, and I had to keep yep. that a secret for a few weeks as well, which was hard. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think just for me, like, having sort of wanted to pursue this career and just, like, seeing how amazing everyone's work is, it's quite intimidating. Um, mm. And, yeah, I'm only, t like, just over two years into my photography career as a professional. So going from hobbyist to professional in such a short amount of time, um, mm. yeah, I think it was a real good kickstart for me to sort of realise that I'm going in the right direction and um, this is where I'm meant to be. Absolutely. And I think what's, what's important and also what's really nice is I've also spoken to Julia Wheeler, who has um, done a lot of um, dive photography and ocean photography herself, so it's really a testament to female photography and, and the way it's coming through in ocean photography, especially. Um, I know Ocean Ramsey and a few other um, high profile photographers have really been doing a great job and certainly in the conservation space. So um, mm. how important is conservation to you, um, Brooke? And, and, and is there some ways that we can, I guess, from what you've learnt that we can do to make things a bit better? Oh, that's such a, a big topic to bring mm. up. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, for me, like, I've always sort of had that connection with the ocean, like, for such mm. a long time now. And having been diving for such a long time as well, you do start to notice those changes that are happening. Yeah. Um, yep. Like, diversity loss and, yeah, the destruction mm. of reefs overfishing is a big one as well so I just think that yeah if if you can find some way to connect yourself to the ocean whether it's through um, photography or just snorkeling or even just like lessening the amount of fish you eat or just mm. being like a slightly more environmentally friendly lifestyle like all these things do change um, make changes and yeah like photography is so important in that because mm. if you're someone who like has never dived or snorkeled before, like how are you going to like have a connection to the water? Like Definitely. photography is that, like bridge between between people that um, don't have a direct contact with it and are able to realise like how beautiful and how important it is that we s sustain the environment. Um, and, yeah, without like visual tools like photography and video, yeah, we just can't achieve that. Yeah, that's a really good answer. Thank you very much, Brooke. Um, now, Brooke, we would like to go through some of your photos. So I'm just going to pull them up on the screen now. Um, so give me one second. Perfect. So we'll start with this image here. Um, Brooke, do you want to explain briefly about these images and this one in particular for me? Yeah, so this is actually a really recent photo that I took on a trip uh, to Raja Ampat in Indonesia. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a bit of a spontaneous shot at the time because I didn't expect to see this. Um, so basically yeah. it's a mangrove forest uh, with a coral reef 
directly underneath it and it was super shallow so it was quite hard to get in there and get a photo um mm. and i was scuba diving as well so i was actually just floating at the surface <laughs> with my dive gear which seemed kind of pointless um, <laughs> But yeah, the real challenge here was getting the the trees and the coral in focus together. Um, so mm -hmm. it is actually one photo; it's not two composed images together. Awesome. Luckily, so, the trees and coral were kind of the same distance from the lens, so yes. it was possible to do. Yeah. Yeah, because this is one of probably the hardest techniques, I guess, to nail uh, in the water as well. Is the over under image, and that's something that you can only really achieve with a fisheye lens. Is that would that be correct to say, Brooke? Yeah, fisheye lens and um, quite a big glass dome. But I actually have quite mm. a small glass dome. I think mine's only about eight inches across. So it's yep. not one of them. You can get really big ones, Massive which ones. makes it easier. But yeah. another thing is that the surface of the water was very calm. So um, it was possible for me to do this. And I did have to really shut down my aperture to about F20. And I had to yeah, bump right. my up to 800 to achieve this. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. And, yeah, this image actually I took yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Good timing. So, yeah, uh, we went out on our tinny yesterday and I managed to spot, this is a, a leopard shark or some people call it a zebra shark. And this is quite a rare coloration. It's super white and it made it quite hard to capture because the white was basically glowing and it captured mm. water particles around it were also capturing that light. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I really had to close my aperture down for this. Um, but I did then, I did about a se uh, one tenth of a second shutter speed to just get that beautiful motion blur as well. Um, and this is yeah, without, cool. so this is all natural lighting, that one. Beautiful. And how how far deep are you at this stage, Brooke? Um, so this was just snorkeling. I think I dove down to maybe three metres, so not very deep at all. Awesome. Um, this one gets some mixed reactions because most mm. people don't try to see snakes. And um, I actually have an interesting photo of myself in the water photographing this from a customer that took it yeah, of me. Right. No one All was right. busy enough to get in, but basically what's going on here is, is two sea snakes mating. So you can see like the head of both snakes and they're intertwined in this kind of knot. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was really difficult to capture um, because it was very overcast and quite glary. Yep. Um, yeah, I really had to hold the camera sort of just below the surface to get that sort of mirrored effect effect mm. um, of the water there. Yeah. Without push, pushing it above surface because that would have just fully blown it out. So, yeah. 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 Yep. Awesome. And did, how close are you at this stage? Because obviously... Um, with a fisheye lens, you've got to go pretty pretty wide. Were you were you quite intimidated to get the shot or is it just something that um, was kind of really nice to get? Yeah, like I've always felt comfortable with sea snakes. They're very mm. docile animals. So I was right. very close. It's probably about 50 centimetres from them. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. It's <laughs> pretty epic. Uh, yeah. this, um, you can see this one? Yep, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is the photo I was talking about earlier about the, the krill. So this mm. is a whale shark feeding in krill, and obviously this is the back end of a whale shark as it basically did a U-turn right in front of me, um, yep. the tail just missing me and my camera. Um, yes. But it was zooming so fast that I didn't even really see it coming until it was right there. And, yeah, wow. you can see the, the, the pink bits. That's all krill in the water. So, yeah, this was one of the most exciting experiences to be in the water. Amazing. That was pretty exhilarating, yeah. Yeah, yeah wow. Yeah. And, yeah, getting a good dolphin interaction is not something that happens very often. Um, and this kind of happened by accident while we were snorkeling. Um, this mother dolphin with her calf, this the little one in the background is actually a baby, yep. um, they were amazed by us they were like circling around us for about 15 minutes and just I don't know if she could see her reflection in the lens but yeah she just kept zooming up and looking right at me and yeah it was <laughs> <laughs> I think I was really out of breath because I was just so like in awe of these amazing animals <laughs> yeah. yeah wow Jeez. Yeah. awesome perfect conditions that day as well yeah it looks epic um this shot was 
yeah, I wish I took more photos on this day because, mm. yeah, it's not something you see very often. This is like um, thousands of red bell jellyfish yep. and actually whale sharks don't like them. Um, mm. So I started to dive down underneath them and so I was swimming on top looking down and, yeah, I just loved the way that the red really stood out against the blue. It was just like yeah. floating in space. Yeah. yeah, wow. And this was captured floating at the surface, like shooting directly down. Yeah. Jeez. And with natural, um, with natural light? Yeah, cool. Um, is this something that occurs very often? Is this sort of like a jellyfish like mating period? How does this sort of occur? Um, it seems to happen every year um, hmm. just before winter. I'm not sure like why they end up here, but it must be something to do with the ocean currents and the wind but yeah these jellyfish do sort of drift down the coast every year um yeah, cool. so we, we get thousands of them yeah it's wow. pretty interesting and are they do they sting or they don't have much of a sting at all is that something you can swim down into or is that something you sort of stay away from um yeah they certainly sting and um, yeah. yeah i can, <laughs> I can would attest not, would not that. recommend no no <laughs> um, as long as you're fully covered, like with a wetsuit, and I was wearing a hoodie as well, um, yeah, you're fine. There you, can you just go. Push it away. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So this was one of the photos that I entered in uh, with my portfolio into the Female Fifty Fathoms Award. Yes. Um, this is another leopard shark or zebra shark um, photograph from top down in really shallow water. Um, I just loved the like reflections of the sunbeams coming off the sand and the mm. way they dance across the skin of the leopard shark. Beautiful. It's one of my favorite photos. Yeah, it's a really good contrast. And yeah, so when I was talking earlier about how on my very first day at work, I managed to get some of my favorite photos. This is my first day working as a professional Jeez. photographer. And um, I probably should have taken advantage of that clear blue water a bit more. I thought, you know, I was like, oh, this is must be normal. That was my first day out there. <laughs> yeah, and now looking back, I was like, oh, my gosh, like that day was insane. Like I think the viz was maybe 50 metres. Like you could just see right to the bottom and this whale shark looks tiny because it's down at about 15 metres depth and I'm at the surface. Yeah, wow. But it's just super clear. But, yeah, that's one of my favourite photos. Jeez, not a bad first day on the job, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and obviously to, the, the key is when it's a, a good day and good conditions to take as many photos as you can. Absolutely, yeah. You've really got mm. to capitalise on that because it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. What, what do you do in those circumstances where you're prepped, you're ready, you go out for the day and the conditions are somewhat miserable um, in terms of... Um, visibility um, and obviously how to photograph. Is there is there methods um, or techniques that you can try to make that a better experience overall? You were talking about using a fisheye lens, but mm. is, is, are those days un, are like unshootable or is there still ways to rescue that experience? Um, the only way to really get a good photo on those kind of days is to get like as close as you can, which right. with marine life is hard because they mm. don't necessarily want you that close. Uh, sure. So quite often it just means, yeah, just wait for a better day. <laughs> yep. No, cool. Um, yeah, this is also a photo that I took on my first day um, and I've never seen <laughs> it like this before as well, having an oceanic manta ray swimming over the white sand um, and having one pose so perfectly. Yeah, I wish I took my fo more photos this day as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Jeez. New, new job, new gear, and you're nailing photos like these. How do you um, <laughs> how do you um, get this sort of technique or shot? Is this kind of looking back up into the sun, or is this going from top down? So this is top down. So mm. the white that you can see below is like a big white sand patch, and I think yep. the depth here was maybe about. 10 or 15 metres deep and then because it was so sunny, the light's just bouncing back and it just looks like the man is swimming through clouds or or like the sun or something. Mm, mm. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful image. And, yeah, shots like these are super hard to get because it's super rare that the surface of the water is so calm. So you need a mm. day with, like, zero wind, zero yep. swell. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah, I was swimming with this whale, whale shark for quite a while, but I was trying to really get that mirrored shot. But because I was swimming next to it, I was actually disturbing the water. And it wasn't until uh, I back and started swimming behind that I managed to capture this sort of near perfect mirror shot um, with the slight ripples of the water. Yeah. Fantastic. We love that shark. <laughs> yeah. Is this, is this something you would maybe describe a bit of like a, a Brook Pike sort of image where you've got that mirror reflection, you like to get obviously a bit more of the tail involved as well. Is this something that is, would you describe as your style or is this something uh, just another technique you like to utilize? Yeah, I think it's just a technique I like to, mm. to use. Um, if I ever see the water in these kind of conditions, I definitely try and um, make the most that. of it. Yeah, it's not something you get very often. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, there's some uh, epic images in there for sure. And obviously that's culminated in the, the award win, which is awesome. So congratulations again. Um, that is amazing achievement. Um, now, I guess a couple of questions I would like to ask is, um, and probably the biggest one that a lot of people at home are wanting to ask after looking at your images um, and hearing a little bit about your journey in your life. Um, how do you turn a passion into a career? Oh, that's a big one. Um, a lot of and dedication. how does that translate to you? <laughs> 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 um, I think just like I'm quite a driven person. Like once I find something that I want to do or I want to achieve, I just mm -hmm. all my energy on that. And I think it's just a matter of sort of figuring out what it is you want to do um, and maybe just like meeting people who already work in that field, reading about it online. Yeah. Um and then just getting out there and doing it. Like you just need to spend hours out there. It doesn't happen overnight. And you can't just rock up to the beach and expect mm. to capture amazing underwater images. Like the photos yep. that I have taken hours and hours out in the water. Um, and mm. there are a lot of days I go out and I don't get a single photo that I like out of like 600 photos. So yeah, awesome. yeah, it is just time, lots of time. Yeah, awesome. Um, and Obviously, you've listed some, but how, how would people, how would you get someone uh, wanting to start doing a bit of underwater photography into doing a photography and making sure it's something that they like? Would they, would they necessarily need a photography background or would they need a diving background or is it just something that giving it a go would be a really good starting point? Um, I would say definitely get into diving first. Mm. Um, because having a camera in your hand and being in the water just adds another level of like a safety issue. So mm -hmm. making sure you're like a very strong swimmer, um, yep. you have a lot of snorkeling experience if you're going to go down that path or maybe learning how to free dive. Mm. Um, but being like a lot of practice at scuba diving and just having that really good buoyancy control to make sure that when you take a camera in your hands, you're not going to smash into the reef or um, put yourself in any kind of danger. So, yeah, just build those diving skills first before you attempt getting a camera. And yep. um, perhaps, That's really good advice. Yeah, just get like a small compact camera that you can sort of grow with, like something that has full manual control. Like I used a Canon G12. I think there's mm. other old is that a bit newer than that and probably have way better capabilities but you know without being a massive full frame heavy camera that you've got to tow with you um something mm. a bit more compact that you can practice with see if you like it before you invest lots of money in like a, a professional setup absolutely and obviously there's there's a lots of different genres you can get into as you listed before you could be doing surf photography you could be doing a bit of scuba stuff you could be just doing free diving so it is quite very different i'm I imagine if um, if you want to stay within Canon, you could try something like a G1X uh, with with the housing. Um, I know that's pretty pop popular. Colin Baker um, from Canon has done a lot of trips with the G1X, and he has uh, had some really good results. Um, yeah. I guess what what are some lasting comments from yourself, Brooke? Um, just in words of encouragement or words of people following out their dreams and their passion. Um, don't give up. Just spend as much time out there practicing as you can like mm -hmm. just go to your nearest beach or if you've got somewhere where you can snorkel that's a really good place to start even like something like a small gopro can be a good starting point as well just sort of finding what angles work for photography um, in the water learning how to read the conditions as well like the weather and tides and that sort of thing is really yep. important but 
yeah. mostly just get out there and practice and maybe find someone else that loves it as well so that you can sort of work together and sort of learn from each other too can be really good. Cool. Are there any sort of community groups or anything that you could recommend um, for people to join? Is there any some is there some words of advice that you followed initially? Um, there's a really great online um, uh, resource that is um, very useful called the Underwater Photography Guide, um, cool. and they have heaps of reviews up there and all sorts of like cameras and gear and settings and things like that. And that's kind that's of a really like, good tip. Times, yeah. So definitely check that out as well. Awesome. Now, obviously the last question I'm just going to ask Brooke is what's next for, for Brooke Pike? Are you, obviously you were talking about the print store that you have and doing the markets and, and how do people follow it, your journey and, and keep in touch? Um, I think my biggest one is definitely Instagram. So if you follow mm -hmm. me on there, I, I don't post every day, but almost every day, especially on the story. So if you want to follow yeah. what I'm up to, um, check out that. Otherwise, my website, I've got prints up there. Um, but yeah, if you're coming up to Exmouth um, and you're coming out on a whale shark tour, you might bump into me um, or at the Sunday markets in Exmouth as well. There you go. Awesome. Um, and lastly, Western Australia, why is that um, a, a part of the world that people should experience a little bit more? Western Australia, like it's so big, but if you're a lover of like the great outdoors, mm. hiking, surfing, diving, snorkeling, like there's endless possibilities for you here. Um, Exmouth is a really great spot to visit if you love snorkeling and diving because it's super accessible. You yep. can swim off the coast here and you can snorkel on the reef immediately from the shore, like different to the Great Barrier Reef where you've got to take a boat for a couple of hours to reach the reef. Ours is mm. literally couple hundred metres off the beach and you're surrounded by marine life. So, yeah, highly recommend to get out here and experience that. There you go. Perfect. Awesome selling point. Hey, thank you very much, Brooke. It's been um, a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you for everything you've shared. Um, and congratulations again for your award and good luck for the future because you're doing some fantastic stuff. And not only for yourself, but for all female photographers out there. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Brooke. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. So that was Brooke Pike, a very, very talented female underwater photographer. And obviously she's doing a bit above ground as well. Um, so please do check out our Instagram and make sure you keep in touch. Awesome. Well, that is tonight's show. Thank you very much for joining us for On The Couch. Hope you had a really good time. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. Follow us on Camera Pro AU um, for all the changes um, and updates and everything along the way. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. If there's anything else um, you would like to learn about underwater photography or aspects of different gear that you would like to use, please get in touch with our team on 1300 431 431 and we'll absolutely love to help you out. Thank you again for joining us and have a good evening.